We're going to be looking at Psalm 10, 11, 12, and into Psalm 13 today. Beginning at verse 1 in Psalm 10, reading to verse, uh, verse 4. The psalmist writes, Why do you stand afar off, O Lord? Why do you hide yourself in times of trouble? The wicked in his pride persecutes the poor. Let them be caught in the plots which they have devised. For the wicked boasts in his heart's, of his heart's desire. He blesses the greedy and renounces the Lord. The wicked in his proud countenance does not seek God. God is in none of his thoughts. I'll continue reading. His ways are always prospering. Your judgments are far above, out of his sight. As for all his enemies, he sneers at them. He has said in his heart, I shall not be moved. I shall never be in adversity. His mouth is full of cursing and deceit and oppression. Under his tongue is trouble and iniquity. He sits in the lurking places of the villages. In the secret places, he murders the innocent. His eyes are secretly fixed on the helpless. He lies in wait secretly as a lion in his den. He lies in wait to catch the poor. He catches the poor when he draws him into his net. So he crouches. He lies low that the helpless may fall by his strength. He has said in his heart, God has forgotten. He hides his face. He will never see it. We'll stop there. As we look at Psalm 10, Psalm 10 is a prayer for God to move quickly to help those who are suffering unjustly. And notice with me as we looked at these few verses in the psalm that the psalmist describes the power, arrogance, ungodliness, and disdain of those whom he refers to as being wicked. The word wicked simply means those who are hostile to God or guilty of sin against God or man. And the word wicked is used six times in this psalm. And he asks the question, why is it that you seem to simply stand back and allow the wicked to continue? Why do you not rescue those who are suffering such persecutions and affliction? You see, to the psalmist, it seems that the wicked may very well triumph over the righteous. Now, this is an age-old problem, the problem of seeing good people suffer and the ungodly succeed. Many of us have seen that in our lifetimes. We've seen people who are scoundrels, who seem to have just great lives. I mean, their kids go to Harvard or Stanford. And we do the best we can, and our kids get a GED. And we think, what's going on here? Why is it that good people seem to die young, and the evil seem to just go on and on and on? That's a good question. And as we look at this, that's what he's asking in verse 1. Notice he says, why do you stand afar off, O Lord? Why do you hide yourself in times of trouble? It's interesting that he may have that question, the question that the wicked seem to even triumph over the righteous, but I would have you to notice that he really doesn't supply a complete answer for us in this psalm. You'll see that in just a moment. But he does say, why don't you rescue those who are suffering such persecution and affliction? It seems that they're w the wicked are triumphing, and it just doesn't seem right. It doesn't line up with what you've said in the past. You see, I think that's where a lot of people have their problems because there are so many scriptures that speak concerning people reaping what they sow. All the way in the Old Testament book of Deuteronomy in chapter 32, verse 35, God said, Vengeance is mine and recompense. Their foot shall slip in due time, for the day of their calamity is at hand, and the things to come hasten upon them. So God has said, they're not going to get away with it, and yet sometimes it seems that they do. Now, the answer to this riddle is not so much resolution as it is refocusing. Justice does not always come in our lifetime, but it ultimately does come. The psalmist in Psalm 73, verse 16 says, When I thought how to understand this, it was too painful for me until I went into the sanctuary of God, and then I understood their end. Sometimes it may seem that the wicked get away with a lot, but all you need to do is spend time with God, get into His Word, and you discover indeed that God is a just God. And, and Paul tells us when he speaks to the Romans that sometimes people take the goodness of God almost like it's license or permission to continue in their sin without realizing that God is extending mercy to them to give them space to repent. 
And it's in the mercy of God that he hasn't moved quickly. Notice in verses 2 following, he speaks of the wicked. He says, in the wicked, uh, the wicked in his pride persecutes the poor. He goes on to say, let them be caught in their own plots, basically. You see, when we think of the wicked, and I should speak about this for just a moment, when we speak of the wicked or think of the wicked, well, that word wicked to me connotes somebody who's extremely evil. Uh, we think of people who are just the worst of the worst. Uh, for many, the average person is not what you would call wicked. And to a degree, this is true. The fact is there are many people who do very kind and very wonderful things. They're not as wicked as they could be. But I want you to notice something. The psalmist describes and defines for us what constitutes being wicked. Now, how does he describe this wicked man? Now, as we've gone through these verses here up to verse 11, this is what he has said. Now, listen carefully. This is what he said, that it is to be wicked. A wicked man is proud. He persecutes the righteous. He boasts. He admires wealth. He renounces God. He thinks himself beyond ever failing. He does not believe he will ever have real problems. He curses. He lies. He oppresses. He uses speech to cause trouble and spread evil. He lies in wait to kill the innocent, and he overpowers the weak. The fact is, the wicked man is all around us. We see this all the time. The wicked man kid kidnaps children and, and murders them. A wicked person is the one who shoots kids and, and rapes college co-eds. The wicked man breaks into houses, robs banks, joins gangs, and kills in the name of his God. And we're familiar with the wicked because the wicked can be found everywhere. But I would have you remember that when you look at how he described the rich, uh, rather the wicked, he could also be a CEO in, in some of America's most prosperous companies. He could also be a doctor. He could be a teacher. He, he could be a lawyer. He, he could be a pastor of a church. The wicked uh, is not just those who do all those evil things. I, I know that the wicked undoubtedly is involved in in the film industry, and he's undoubtedly involved in the music industry. The wicked seem to get away with things all the time, and I find it interesting to note that, that many times those who are admired the most and are given the most awards are also people who, by definition in Scripture, are really not to be admired. I'm thinking of just a couple days ago watching the news and Meryl Streep receiving her Golden Globe Award. Couldn't just say thank you for the award. She had to give her political agenda. She had to begin to tear into, into the President of the United States. They just can't leave it alone, can they? So she says something to the effect that there's nothing wrong with, with homosexual marriage and, and there are worse problems than steroids in sports. And the bottom line is, is that had nothing to do with receiving a Golden Globe for whatever trashy movie she was involved in. But what happens, but what happens, you see, is these are the ones that are admired the very most. I think shallow as many movie stars can be, their, co their comments register deeply in the heart of many people. Uh, many who cry out for, you know, cry, actually cry for the, the snail darter and and would never wear fur, are pro-partial birth abortion. When you look at verse 8 here, I want you to see this. When it says, he, he sits in the lurking places of the villages, in the secret places he murders the innocent, his eyes are secretly fixed on the helpless. I have a note that I put here years ago, and it was for myself, but I'll repeat it here to you. That sounds very much like that could be, now, and I'll, I'll develop this for you for a second here, that could be an abortion clinic. I want you to see how it's described. Notice again, he sits in the lurking places in the village. In the secret places, he murders the innocent. You know, the wicked person isn't just hiding out there somewhere when you walk by an alley so he can jump out and hit you with a hatchet. A wicked person could be somebody who's working in some of these laboratoriums. You know, in Hollywood, if you are a conservative, you're not going to get any work. Yet actors and musicians get all the attention and are admired by so many. When Rosie O'Donnell came out of the closet, one magazine called her brave. 
sometimes we can begin to wonder if the Lord is ever going to vindicate His name, and that's why He's saying, why do you stand afar off, O Lord? Why do you hide yourself in times of trouble? We might cry out, why are, you, why are you waiting, Lord? Why aren't you doing something about this? And that's what the psalmist is saying. You see, here in the 21st century, we're not the only people who've ever wondered why the Lord delays His responses. You know, I think of some of these people who could be classified as successful yet defined as wicked, and these people often travel the world. They live in $15 million homes. They eat at the best restaurants. They have the finest doctors, the most expensive clothes. They're world famous, and when they die, the news agencies from around the world report their deaths. But by virtue of their decadent lifestyles, they've ruined many, and they think they're never going to pay for it. And that's what he's speaking about here. That's why he says that the Lord should arise. Notice in verse 12 when he says, Arise, O Lord, O God, lift up your hand. Do not forget the humble. Why do the wicked renounce God? He said in his heart, You will not require an account. But you have seen it, for you observe trouble and grief to repay it by your hand. The helpless commits himself to you. You are the helper of the fatherless. Break the arm of the wicked and the evil man. Seek out his wickedness until you find none. Break the arm. That's a pretty strong thing to say, huh? Psalmist is kind of violent, huh? Break their teeth, break their arms. I like the psalmist. He's a good guy. Why should God come to the rescue? Well, because humble and helpless people trust in him. You notice as we have been reading here, the wicked believe that they're going to get away, get away with this. They're never going to have to pay. But in 2 Thessalonians 1, 6, the apostle Paul said, it's a righteous thing with God to repay with tribulation those who trouble you. So indeed, they are going to pay. The Lord, verse 16, is king forever and ever. The nations have perished out of his land. Lord, you have heard the desire of the humble. You will prepare their heart. You will cause your ear to hear to do justice to the fatherless and the oppressed, that the man of the earth may oppress no more. So he's basically simply saying, in spite of all of this, the Lord will move in the right time. And I know that God has heard my prayer. God will hear the cry of those who are afflicted, and God ultimately will do that which is just. Why is that? Well, he says in verse 16, because the Lord is king forever and ever. That's why. In verse 17, you have heard the desire of the humble. That's why. In verse 18, you will do justice to the fatherless. So God, you can always count on this. God hears your prayer. He does hear your prayer. And there are times, indeed, we'll see this again in just a couple more Psalms, where we may cry out and say, Lord, it seems like you're not moving. But the Lord has a perfect time, and he always moves in the right time. Psalm 11. In the Lord... I put my trust. How can you say to my soul, flee as a bird to your mountain? For look, the wicked bend their bow. They make ready their arrow on the string that they may shoot secretly at the upright in heart. If the foundations are destroyed, what can the righteous do? Now the Lord is in his holy temple. The Lord's throne is in heaven. His eyes behold. His eyelids test the sons of men. The Lord tests the righteous. But the wicked and the ones who love violence, his soul hates. Upon the wicked he will rain coals, fire and brimstone and burning wind. This shall be the portion of their cup. For the Lord is righteous. He loves righteousness. His countenance beholds the upright. And so in Psalm 11, David is in danger. And David is tempted to run away from his problem. So this has put him in a position of having to decide whether he's going to trust God in the midst of his situation. That's why he says... In verse 1, in the Lord I put my trust. How can you say to my soul, flee as a bird to your mountain? It would seem that he has been given counsel to flee for the good of his life, for his own safety. But his response to that is, I put my trust in the Lord and I won't run from danger. Now that reminds me of something you find in the book of Nehemiah. In the Old Testament book of Nehemiah, Nehemiah had returned to rebuild the walls in the city of Jerusalem. And while he was there doing the work of rebuilding... He began to encounter, as some of you remember, all of you who have read the book remember, he began to encounter uh, some opposition. There were those who were, were doing everything they could to discourage him. And so on one occasion, it's recorded in Nehemiah chapter 6, verses 10 through 13, uh, Nehemiah said, I, I came to the house of Shemaiah, the son of Deleah, the son of Mehetabel, who was a secret informer. 
And he said, Let us meet together in the house of God within the temple. Let us close the doors of the temple, for they are coming to kill you. Indeed, at night they will come to kill you. And I said, Should such a man as I flee? And who is there such as I who would go into the temple to save his life? I will not go in. Then I perceived that God had not sent him at all, but that he pronounced this prophecy against me because Tobiah and Sanballat had hired him. For this reason he was hired, that I should be afraid and act that way and sin, so that they might have cause for an evil report that they might reproach me. Should such a man as I flee? No. You see, and I want you to see this because he said they wanted to have a cause for an evil report so they might reproach me. So people will say, well, where is your God? David's receiving counsel. And the counsel is like a bird flees to the mountain. You ought to run and save your life. And he's saying, absolutely not. There's no way. They're saying, they're, they're, they're getting ready their bow. They're bending it and, and they're going to fire at you. They're going to shoot secretly at you. You ought to go. Notice verse 3 here in Psalm 11. If the foundations are destroyed, what can the righteous do? The wicked are constantly attempting to undermine. They are constantly un undermining the foundations of all that we hold to be dear and true. The wicked want to replace God with their own philosophies and laws. That was taking place then and it's taking place now. And so they're saying basically everything is opposing you. And yet he's saying, well, it's the Lord that I have put my trust in, so your advice isn't something that I'm going to respond well to it, too. That's why in verse 4 he says, the Lord is in his holy temple. The Lord's throne is in heaven. His eyes behold. His eyelids test the sons of men. The Lord tests the righteous. But the wicked and the ones who love violence his soul hates. So you have options, either to trust him or not to. And as he's saying right now, guys, there are times when the Lord is actually putting a test before you, not so that you'll stumble, but so that your faith is going to be refined and strengthened as you trust in Him. And the Lord will give us opportunities, many opportunities through our lifetime as we follow Him, to make choices, whether to trust Him or whether to not, whether to flee or whether to remain firm and strong and hold fast to Him. And you may say, well, that may occur in somebody else's life. That really doesn't occur in mine. I've discovered that through a lifetime, you have many opportunities to trust the Lord or reject His counsel. If you build your life on the, on the Word of the Lord, trusting God on a daily basis, you grow to know the ways of God. And the more you grow to know the ways of God, the more you'll trust Him and put faith in Him because He proves Himself faithful to you every time you trust Him. But there will also always be people there will say, this is really a foolish thing to do. You really ought not to do that. And then you'll have an opportunity, whether to trust the Lord or the trust in the man who says to you, you really ought not to attempt to do that. You really ought to pull back. You really ought not to. And so we've discovered a long time ago it's good to trust in the Lord, and the Lord has his eyes on everything. Now notice how he speaks about his throne being in heaven. In other words, he's not impressed with or afraid of the wicked. He's watching everything, and nothing gets by him. Proverbs 5.21 says, The ways of man are before the eyes of the Lord. And he ponders all his paths. Proverbs 15, verse 3 says, The eyes of the Lord are in every place, keeping watch on the evil and the good. Now notice with me in verse 6 how he says, Upon the wicked he will rain coals, fire and brimstone and burning wind. This shall be the portion of their cup. God is going to judge them for their wicked deeds. Notice with me fire and brimstone. Think of brimstone when you think of Sodom and Gomorrah and burning wind. This all speaks of a scorching judgment. God is going to bring judgment. It reminds me of Malachi chapter 4, verse 1, where God says, Behold, the day is coming, burning like an oven. All the proud, yes, all who do wickedly will be stubble. And the day which is coming shall burn them up, says the Lord of hosts, that will leave them neither root nor branch. Verse 7 says, For the Lord is righteous. He loves righteousness. His countenance beholds the upright. And so the Lord is making it very clear that his eyes are upon them. And those who walk uprightly will receive the welcome words of the Lord when he says unto them, enter in. Psalm 12. Help. I've said that before, have you? Help. 
Help, Lord, for the godly man ceases, for the faithful disappear from among the sons of men. They speak idly, everyone with his neighbor, with flattering lips and a double heart they speak. May the Lord cut off all flattering lips and the tongue that speaks proud things, who have said, with our tongue we will prevail, our lips are our own. Who is Lord over us? For the oppression of the poor, for the sighing of the needy, now I will arise, says the Lord. I will set him in the safety for which he yearns. The words of the Lord are pure words, like silver tried in a furnace of earth, purified seven times. You shall keep them, O Lord. You shall preserve them from this generation forever. The wicked prowl on every side when vileness is exalted among the sons of men. And so he cries out for help. I want you to notice that this psalm contrasts idle, ungodly words with the sure promises of God. Now, it's interesting how David begins because he says, Help, Lord, for the godly man ceases, for the faithful disappear from among the sons of men. You know, sometimes it can seem that righteous people are extinct. Sometimes it can appear that there aren't very many people or any at all who really care about what is right and what is wrong. I was speaking to someone just today about that. We're having a conversation. And uh, we're sharing, relating to that subject there that, that sometimes it, it appears that, that people really don't have a good idea about what it means to hold fast to God and hold fast to His Word. And even people who go to church, even people who, who profess to, to be Christians very often are, are people who, who with their lips will profess to have a relationship with God, but with their lives they deny Him in their actions. And, and it's possible, it's possible, even like David, where he said it seems that the godly people are, are pretty much extinct. It could seem that that in the midst of, of what we today would consider to be a, an outpouring of God's desire, at least, to reach many, and some churches are just bursting at the seams. There are so many hundreds of people who go to churches. You know, there are churches you haven't even heard of that I've never even heard of. For example, I, I learned of a church. I'll give you one example. I learned of a church in Chicago, in the south side of Chicago. Anybody here who's familiar with Chicago, or perhaps I have somebody who's, who's from that area or from Chicago, knows that the south side of Chicago is pretty rough. It's a pretty rough area. And... Uh, there's this one fellow there, uh, he's a pastor, his last name is Meeks, and Pastor Meeks picked up a church with 200 members uh, 15, 20 years ago, and has been working, serving the Lord there, and he has a ministry now that numbers like 17,000 people, 17,000 people, and, uh, but how, how often do you hear about that? How often do you hear of, of these mega works, these works that God is doing. You, you won't hear that very often. You don't hear about men like this, Pastor Meeks. You don't hear about some of the men who are being used by the Lord in tremendous ways. Uh, why? I think it's because there is, uh, and I don't think it's a conspiracy of any sort. I just think it's the natural way that things go. But I think it's, it's it, bad news sells and good news doesn't. And, and I believe that we've been basically programmed by what we watch and what we read for so long that we're... we're, we're pretty suspicious, suspicious of anything that may be good or even sounds like it is good. And right now, and, and I might as well say this because I'm thinking about it, and uh, hopefully it makes some sense to you. It's not in my notes, which makes me dangerous. <laughs> but I recently read a book that uh, really was an interesting book to read, and this fellow is a reporter who worked with a major news outlet for, for over 20 years and has an insider's understanding of the way things go. And he was pointing out that in every major newsroom that you can think of, every major newsroom that you can think of, including CNN, you had your ABC, your CBS, your NBC, and every major newsroom that you can think of, all basically has people there in the newsrooms who are basically answering to, to, um, to groups who have influence, tremendous influence in the news. And therefore, if you're going to be doing a story on ABC concerning, I'll just throw this one out, but there's so many others. If you're going to do a, a story on abortion, if you're going to do a story on homosexuality, if you're going to do a story on gun, gun control, if you're going to do a story on things of that nature, that the story actually, we'll say it's going to be on homosexuality, the story is actually passed before um, homosexual organizations who have people who are representing the homosexual view. And so if I'm a reporter, and I'm going to do a story on homosexual marriage, then I will put my thing together 
and they will review it for me. And things they don't like, they'll say, you need to omit this, you need to omit that. You need to say this differently. As a matter of fact, one homosexual group has put out uh, words that you cannot use on TV. And so if you use any of these inflammatory words, they're going to be edited out. Now, we're supposed to be receiving objective news. And one of the things about journalism is a person is supposed to be a reporter without any bias. But the bottom line is, is we bring our biases into everything that we do. And we wonder sometimes, how come the news seems so slanted? Well, the news is slanted. But the problem is, is those who are slanting the news would argue with you and say that they are not slanting it. They'd say that you're the one who's perverse, you're the one who's twisted, because you're a conservative. Now, if you're a liberal, today a liberal is not what liberal was 40 years ago. If you're a liberal today, a liberal considers themselves to be really moderate. But if you're really a liberal, you're going to be pro so many things that the church is opposed to. And so these people who are very much to the left of what we used to say was the center, those people who are very much to the left are actually think themselves to be moderate, which makes you to be a flaming conservative, and so they won't listen to anything you have to say. And you see that to be true. And so if I were to be interviewed, and I, I've had this happen, I've been interviewed, and I have to be very precise how I answer the questions. I'll even go so far as to say, uh, because this is what will happen, I'll give you an example. If they say to me, how did your life change? Because they've asked that question before. How did your life change? I'll say, I committed my heart to Jesus Christ. And then if you read the account, they'll say he became religious. Because that's how they do that. He became religious. So what I have to do is I have to say, now I want you to quote me exactly. That's what I'll tell them. Uh, what happened in your life? Will you please quote me exactly? Yes, okay, exactly what happened is I was born again. That's what happened. I received here, ready? Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. I, I actually have to do that. And they'll, they'll sit there and they'll, oh, okay, and they write that down. Because I learned that by being interviewed on the, on the radio. I've been interviewed before. I've been interviewed for newspapers and things. And in the newsprint, you know, on the radio, it's one thing. They can edit you out. But in the, in the newsprint, when you, you have to be very precise because they hear religious when you say Christian. That's how it works. So there's tremendous bias right now. And there are times when I will pick up the newspaper and I will ask the question, how come we're getting so much news about these people? Why do I have to hear about Hillary Clinton constantly? Why? You know, why is she more special than anybody else, than Barbara Bush? What, what happened here? And there is an obvious bias. You see it everywhere. And you can read your papers, and I'm telling you, you can read your... I'll give you another example if you don't mind. No, Pastor, I don't mind. Okay. Um, you know, we hear a whole lot. I, I, some of you perhaps watched this. I thought it was interesting last week. It was on TV. It was on Friday night. John Stossel was doing something on the myths that all of us Americans have embraced. He's speaking to a fellow. Some of you perhaps saw this. He's speaking to a fellow who is in line uh, to receive... It's like a soup kitchen kind of thing. It's one of these uh, pantries that you can come and receive food because you're in financial need and, and I applaud all the efforts to feed the poor and obviously so but he's being interviewed this fellow is being interviewed and they asked him a question they said to him are you poor and he's in line to get some food and he says yes I am he says you're poor he says yes and so the interviewer said do you have a place that you live he says yeah I have an apartment right across the street he says do you have a TV set he goes yeah it's a color TV he says do you have cable oh absolutely I mean, this guy's got cable, color TV, he's got an apartment, but he's saying, I'm absolutely poor. There's a lady who's being interviewed, and she says, I have to work or we're not going to make it because everything's going down, and, and you have to have two jobs. People have got to work. And so they ask her, are you, are, you, are you having a tough time making it? Absolutely, we're barely making it. So they're interviewing her in her nice home, and then they point out that she's got three cars. And they asked her the question, uh, how come you bought that new van? She said, well, I had to get one with the DVD player and the leather seats and, you know. No, no. And, and the interviewer, Stossel, made the point, and it's a right point. He said, it's not that we're poor, it's that we're materialistic. It's not that we're poor, it's that we're greedy. And you see, and that's what's going on. A lot of us, if we would just look and see whether we could really make it if we want to, the answer is yes, we can. But we have bought into the idea, but in order to make it, I have to have more. I have to have the best. If I don't have the best, then I'm not making it. I'm poor in America. That's not true. That's not true. 
The top one, the top one percent wage earners in the United States make three hundred thousand dollars and above. And all the time we hear of people saying you need to tax the rich so that you can give to the poor. And yet they're already paying. They pay. They they make up thirty four percent of the income of the United States through their taxes. Many of them pay over fifty percent. And so what we in essence do is we we tax those who are successful, and we give to those who sometimes don't want to work. And that's the way we think. And you look out there, and you ask the question again. Uh, you ask the question, Lord, um, where are the righteous people? Where are the people that, that make a difference? You know, and how come we don't hear about that? And, and David is basically saying that. David is basically saying that the godly man is, is going extinct. It's, it seems that the, the faithful person has been replaced with an ungodly person, with an unfaithful and an untrustworthy type. Notice in verses 2 through 4, he says, They speak idly, everyone with his neighbor. And he says, With flattering lips and a double heart. So the ungodly, he says, are those who use flattery and lies to get what they want. They refuse to let anyone exercise any authority over them. Notice verse 4. And they basically have said, With our tongue we will prevail our lips are our own. Who is Lord over us? So they're not going to let anyone exercise authority over them, but he says they are what are called double-hearted. Uh, when he uses the term double-hearted, uh, that means that they are two-faced or what we would today call hypocritical. They're double-hearted. And they use flattery to get what they want. Well, the Bible in Proverbs 20, verse 19 says... He who goes about as a talebearer reveals secrets. Therefore, do not associate with one who flatters with his lips. Proverbs 29, 5 says, A man who flatters his neighbor spreads a net for his feet. So what is his answer to that? Well, in verse 3, he says, May the Lord cut off all flattering lips and the tongue that speaks proud things. May God put an end to such arrogant boasting. Verse 5, For the oppression of the poor, for the sign of the needy, now I will arise, says the Lord. I will set him in the safety for which he yearns. So God promises to, to deliver those who trust in him from the ones who are maligning them. In verse 6 and 7, he says, The words of the Lord are pure words, like silver tried in a furnace of earth, purified seven times. You shall keep them, O Lord. You shall preserve them from this generation forever. In contrast to the hypocritical lies of evil men, he says, we have God's sure and pure word. And that's why we can depend on him because he does not lie and he always performs his word. Ezekiel 12, 25, God said, I'm the Lord. I speak and the word which I speak will come to pass. Verse 8, the wicked prowl on every side when vileness is exalted among the sons of men. When evil is exalted, worthless people strut around in pride and arrogance, and yet God will deliver those who trust in him. Psalm 13. How long, O Lord, will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? How long shall I take counsel in my soul, having sorrow in my heart daily? How long will my enemy be exalted over me? Consider and hear me, O Lord my God. Enlighten my eyes, lest I sleep the sleep of death. Lest my enemies say I have prevailed against him. Lest those who trouble me rejoice when I am moved. But I've trusted in your mercy. My heart shall rejoice in your salvation. I will sing to the Lord, because he has dealt bountifully. With me. There are some psalms that are psalms that the Lord gave to me. There's psalms that are songs that my heart responds to. This is one of those psalms. Have you ever been in that position where you almost say the same thing? How long? How long? Have you ever felt that you've been forgotten by the Lord? How long, Lord, will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? Notice verse 2, How long shall I take counsel in my soul, having sorrow in my heart daily? How long will my enemy be exalted over me? As a young believer, early in my walk with the Lord, without you know, spending too much time developing this but making it practical, as a young believer in my own walk with the Lord, um, I, I, I understood this completely. I understand this completely. 
because there were times there was time in my life there was a time in my life where I went through such a severe trial such a severe sorrow of heart and I've shared this with you before but and it lasted for some time it was so severe that I, I got to the point where I didn't even want to leave my room you know I would go into my room I would stay there and then I'd come out for some of the basic just basic things and uh, and that's what I was going through. I felt like the Lord had deserted me. I felt like I was by myself in all of this. Have you ever felt that way ever? How long, Lord? You know, I, it, it, and, and I want you to know something. Let me share with you. I'll just get to the, I'll cut to the chase and share with you what I learned. Um, for a while there, I, I was afraid that I might be committing the unpardonable sin, that I was walking away from God, that I was unjustly accusing him and, and, and I was concerned about that and one of the things that I learned through that time of sorrow is, uh, is this and I've shared this with others in, in private times when we've, I've been ministering on a one on one and I've said you know the fact that you are wondering where God is reveals not a lack of faith but a depth of faith because you expect God to move and you're wondering why he hasn't See, you haven't gotten to the point where say there is there, of saying there is no God, therefore he's not going to move. You're not saying that. You're saying how come God hasn't moved? And I'm not saying that, that that's a great testimony of faith. What I'm saying is that's an evidence of faith because you really do believe that God should move. You believe that there is a God who should hear your cry. And you're hurt because this one whom you love so much doesn't seem to care right now. And there have been times in my life over the years and without getting, you know, morose about it and sharing a lot, there have been times in my life where as a, a Christian man, I have cried to the Lord and, and I've wept tears. I've, I've, I've caused my couch to be wet with tears, crying and saying, Lord, I just can't take this anymore. I'm not quite sure how far I can go. Without you, I can't go another step. But Lord, right now, I'm just not sure if you're listening to me. Could you please give me some kind of indication somehow that you are listening to me. Can you please, can you please help me to know that you are caring, that you are loving? Again, earlier we were reading how it seems that the wicked sometimes triumph. You know, when my father went home to be with the Lord, when my father-in-law went home to be with the Lord, it caused both Marie and me to begin to think, now, many people I've known who have lived as if there is no God, who have not done well by their life and by their family, by their wife, by their children, by anybody who knew them, and yet they just go on and on and on and on. And then you have these great people, these loving people who seem to die young. You know, I'm, I'm kind of blowing my mind now because I see men who I consider to be young 51 years old, 48 years old, going home to be with the Lord. And I'm beginning to realize that uh, God is extremely merciful because sometimes he gives these old scoundrels so many years to get right with him. So many years, sometimes 70, 75, 80 years. And you see this old sinner, and there's no sinner like an old sinner. You know, and you see these old sinners and you think, man, my papa went home at an early age compared to you and you still keep on ticking. See, David is saying every day is a drudgery for me. Every day has been a continual sorrow. Every day it seems like my enemies are triumphing over me. And so, God, I want to ask you a question. In verse 3, consider and hear me, O Lord my God. Enlighten my eyes. I want to ask you, please open my eyes to see, lest I sleep the sleep of death, lest my enemies say I've prevailed against him, lest those who trouble me rejoice when I'm moved. Lord, I need you to move, and I need you to move desperately. I need you to give me perspective. When he says, enlighten my eyes, God, give me perspective on my circumstances. Help me to see through your eyes. Help me to see what you see, because all I can see right now is I'm losing. In Romans, in chapter 8, verse 28, Paul said it this way. Paul said, We know that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are the called according to His purpose. I can tell you one thing that is a, a certain thing in my life that perhaps some of you can amen in your own heart. 
I can tell you that when I was 30 years old and this church began, I was 30 years old when this church began, I can tell you that in the last 22, 23 years of my life, from the point that this church began, that when I was 30 years old and I ministered, I did not realize, some of you will say amen if you were here then, and there are a few in this church who have been with us since the first day. And some of, some of you have seen, even if you've been here a few years, you've seen a change in my style of ministry. Some of you have witnessed that. Some of you have told me that. And, and where it's come from, I'll tell you where it's come from. It's come through pain. It's come through tears. It's come through sorrow. It's come through loss. That's where it's come from. And what I at one time knew for sure, God had to teach me over again. He had to teach me over again. It's one thing to do funerals, as I have done many funerals. It's one thing to stand up there and comfort and exhort and encourage, but it became quite another thing when I began to bury those whom I love the most. And then you go through the valley yourself. And then you realize how glib you have sounded in the past and how arrogant, undoubtedly, I have sounded. When my children were small, I would give you 10 ways to raise your kids, and I knew for sure my kids were going to be Billy Graham and, and uh, Charlie Manson, yes. Billy Graham, no. <laughs> and now that I've gone through a process of doing the best that I can and failing and learning and all of that, I come with a different attitude, and some of you have seen it. I come with, with experience. I come with humility now knowing that there's no guarantee. You just have to do your best and let God do the rest. You just have to trust Him. You know, I was sure if I do this, I would argue with you hammer and tongue, this is how it's going to be. I am holding fast. Well, I still am holding fast. But I'm holding fast in a different way. I'm holding fast for dear life. <laughs> and you know what? There have been many times and I think I'm speaking to someone who understands this, where in my personal life I have asked the Lord, how long are you going to forget me forever? Lord, I have been praying this prayer for my children since the day they were born. Beyond that, I have been praying this prayer for my children since I discovered through Mama that she was pregnant. For the babies in the womb, all the way to the point where they're at right now, we have prayed every day for them. And you know what? Sometimes you see... Praise the Lord, I see good. And then sometimes you say, Lord, come soon, Lord, quick. You know, Jesus, quickly, Lord Jesus. If you're not going to come soon, would you please just take them? <laughs> I'll come and see them later on. That's just the truth. There's, there's nothing wrong with experiencing life and trusting God through pain. I have heard one sermon stands out, but I've heard more than one sermon given where it almost seemed as if you were faithless, if you wept when you lost somebody you loved. That you should have a party, basically, when you had a funeral rather than have sorrow in your heart. And I've never understood that. I've never understood that. No, I don't think that you should ever wish that they hadn't died in that sense. If they're believers... They're rejoicing with the Lord right now. Who would want to bring him back here? I wouldn't take my dad out of heaven. I wouldn't bring him back here. I want my dad to enjoy Jesus Christ. But I wept, and occasionally I still do. Tomorrow's my dad's birthday. My dad's birthday is tomorrow. He'd have been 77. And look at me. I tell you that, and my heart bursts. Would I bring him back? No. No. But did I say, Lord, why? Absolutely. And you want to know something? The Lord said, because I, you want to know what he said? Because I love him. And I wanted him with me. And you know what? It's fine with me. It's fine with me. Do I miss him? Every day. Every day. Would I bring him back? No. Did I cry out and say, Lord, how long? Yes. Have I ever looked at the society that we live in and ever say, Lord, how long? All the time. All the time. When you hear of two kids riding in the car, getting gunned down for no reason. For no reason. 
Do I cry for them? Yeah, did I know them? No. Why do you cry? Why, Lord? And that, you know what it does to me? It doesn't, by the way, I, I should say this. It doesn't undermine my faith. It makes me stronger to preach stronger because people need Jesus Christ. That's what it does to me. It inflames me. It, it actually causes me to have more of a militant attitude. Let's reach out more. Let's get more. Let's see people saved. That's what it does to me. But David is saying, Lord, it seems like my enemies are triumphing. And so, Lord, enlighten my eyes. Give me your perspective. Lest my enemies say I've prevailed against him. Lest those who trouble me rejoice when I'm moved. Verse 5, but I have trusted in your mercy. My heart shall rejoice in your salvation. I will sing to the Lord because he has dealt bountifully with me. Because I have been faithful to the Lord and I've trusted him. Well, God has produced in my heart a heart of thanksgiving and a heart of praise. Isaiah 12, 2 says, Behold, God is my salvation. I will trust and not be afraid. For God the Lord is my strength and song. He also has become my salvation. I will trust, not be afraid, for the Lord is my strength and my song. That's how it works. I trust in your mercy. My heart rejoices in your salvation and it causes me to sing to you because you have blessed me so much. And so, guys, that, it almost seems like an opposite. On the one hand, you know, how, Lord will you, how long, Lord, will you forget me? And yet he's saying, no, I've trusted in your mercy. I've discovered that the deeper you go in life and the deeper things you go through, the deeper your faith becomes and the more mature you are. And I also believe that some people don't want to grow because they're not willing to pay the price. They're not willing to pay the price. They want a God who just kind of like is a genie. He just, you snap your fingers, he does what you want. For me, I ask the Lord, make me like you, Lord. Make me like you. You read Isaiah 53, he is a wounded healer. If you want to have depth, you go through deep things. If you, have, you want to have a word to give to somebody who's going through sorrow, you will experience sorrow. That's how it works. And, 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 and what happens is it strengthens you. It gives you compassion and empathy, and it gives you an ability to listen carefully when somebody is hurting and not to have a quick answer for them, the solution to all their problems. Because sometimes, guys, all that person really needs is for you to be quiet and to let them vent. And then all you need to do is say to them, sounds like you're going through a pretty tough time. Am I ever? Well, you want to know something? Love you, man. I'll be praying for you. Sometimes you may need to say, you know what? Let me remind you that all things work together for good for those who love God. Let me remind you of God's promises. Sometimes you do that. Many times I've discovered Paul's words where he said, weep with those who weep. Many times I've discovered that some people just need somebody to understand where they're at. It's not that they don't trust the Lord. It's that they just need somebody to be there with them. I think Job's comforters were the best when they were quiet. When they opened their mouth, now they show the big mouths. And they, they were the best counselors when they were just quiet there as he sat there in sorrow. And sometimes we just join in with the people who are going through that. Because you know why? David says, Lord, I'm just wondering. At the end, he says, I'm going to rejoice in your mercy. Because, Lord, the end is always going to be good with you. And I was telling somebody yesterday about that. We were talking, and they said, I don't know what I'm going to do. And I said to them, I'll tell you this. If you follow the Lord, the end is going to be good. No matter what it is, it's going to be good. Because when you're in the center of the will of the Lord, it is always good. It will always be good when you stay in the center of the will of the Lord. So just hang on, and you will rejoice. Just hang on, and you'll love his mercy. Just hang on, and you'll sing songs of praises. But if you walk away, your answer's not going to come. If you remain firm, you will rejoice. And that's what David learned, and that's what we need to learn too.